So this thing fires a beam of light at the warhead, hits it, and then this thing flies up like this. Meanwhile, we're all going like this, fires another beam of light, goes around like this, we're going like this, fires another beam of light, goes down like this, fires another beam of light, and then flies out the way it came in. Malmstrom Air Base in Montana. They saw a craft, appearing to be intelligently controlled, hovered over a nuclear weapon silo and shut down 10 nuclear ICBM missiles. Mm -hmm. The most feared tool ever devised by humanity stems from a fission reaction on the scale of atoms. Nuclear weapons have blighted our species and since their inception, cast a looming threat of assured destruction for all of humanity. But to UFOs, nuclear weapons appear to be a light switch, something they can turn on and off without launch codes, access to a control panel, or multiple key access. During the very height of the Cold War, it became painfully apparent that something on this planet could tamper or control our greatest tools of destruction at a moment's notice. What is up guys? Welcome back to the channel. This is UAP Gerb. Today, I want to cover some of the most fascinating and well-documented cases of UFOs tampering with nuclear weapons throughout the Cold War. The how and the why, we'll save that for a little later. So for now, let's venture into some instances where humans were reminded that we are not the top dogs on our planet. In 1964, U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Robert Jacobs served as commanding officer in charge of optical instrumentation at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. During his duties, he was in charge of a 100-man unit providing crucial engineering photography for every nuclear payload and ballistic missile launch from the Western Test Range near Big Sur. Jacobs' duties were so crucial to military applications due to the high failure rate of missiles on the pad in the early 60s. On September 14th of 64, Jacobs and his squadron were set to record the launch of a dummy nuclear warhead. The three stages of this ICBM, or Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, were constructed to dupe Russian defenses into shooting down the missile chaff as a nuclear warhead would separate from the rocket to deliver payload. This would mean if the US was to attack Russia, Russian anti-air defense would shoot down the missile, but not the warhead. It is crucial to note, for these tests, the nuclear warhead dummies were the exact size, dimensions, and weight as conventional nuclear warheads. The lieutenant patiently observed missile liftoff with his photography instrumentation so sensitive, it was able to photograph the quote, nuts and bolts of the missile. Looking near southwest, Jacobs observed the missile pop out from the fog. Utilizing his telescopes and 180-inch lenses, Jacobs observed all three stages of flight without a hitch. Jacobs did note a smoke trail going off into subspace during stage three of separation. But upon mission completion, Jacobs submitted the film back to Vandenberg. Then, within the next day or two, Jacobs was summoned to the office of his commanding officer, Major Florence J. Mansman. When he met Mansman, he found him and three men in gray suits waiting, later admitted by the Major to be the director of the Office of the Chief Scientist and his two government agent assistants. Mansman ordered Jacobs to take a seat on a couch where a nearby 16 millimeter projector was set up and told him to watch. Jacobs initially observed the Big Sur launch quite exciting, but nothing out of the ordinary. Quote, we could see the bottom three stages of that rocket filling the frame from 160 miles away. It was amazing. The clarity was beautiful and we watched it go through all three stages of powered flight. And that's when Jacobs noticed something enter the frame. The nose cones separate. The chaff flew out in front of it. We saw this as obviously reflections of light rippling like that. And then we saw the dummy warhead flying along. It's going between six and 8,000 miles an hour at that point, and it's on the, the, the fringe of space. And suddenly, into that, that frame, an object flew in, chasing the chaff, the warhead, and so on, at the same speed. And in polar orbit, 
It fired a beam of light at the warhead. The, the beam of light struck that. The object flew up, shot another beam of light at the dummy warhead, went around, shot another beam of light at it, went down, shot a beam of light, and then flew out the same way to come in, at which time the dummy warhead fell out of the frame. The object observed in the tape was described by the lieutenant as a classic flying saucer shape. Two saucers pressed against one another with rounded edges with a hemisphere on top, as Jacobs described as half of a ping pong ball. Now, what's really interesting here is that the lieutenant says the directed beam of light came out from the ping pong ball on top of the craft. The tape concluded the lights came on and Mansman looked at Jacobs furious and asked if he and his team were screwing around at the launch site. Mansman asked, what was that? To which Jacobs replied, quote, looks to me like we got a UFO. After further discussion, the major told Jacobs that he was never to speak of this again. Quote, as far as you're concerned, this never happened. I don't need to emphasize the dark consequences of a security breach. Mansman then told Jacobs if years from then he was ever asked about this incident or forced to tell, Jacobs must explain the case away as, quote, laser tracking strikes. Now in 1964, laser tracking strikes did not exist. In fact, lasers were still in their infancy stage. At this point, Jacobs let go of this case for 18 years. And during this time, nobody else on Vandenberg Air Force Base saw this film. Years after this incident, Mansman actually told Jacobs that the men in gray suits took the film and snipped off the UFO footage with scissors placing it in their briefcase while handing the major the edited film and also threatening him and ordering him to consider the incident closed. It was not until 1982 that Jacobs told his tale and he did because he reasoned that he never signed any confidentiality or non-disclosure agreements. He was never told that this case was classified so eventually he figured I must tell about my experience. When he did, he faced severe reprisals and harassment. Constant telephone calls engaged with him through the night, telling him, quote, you're going down, mother effer. Shockingly, MUFON reported this case in 1985, and Mansman corroborated Jacob's story. In this sign response to personnel at Paramount Pictures who were making a documentary on this case, Mansman highlighted the incident told by Jacobs as absolute fact, quote, I am writing to confirm Dr. Jacobs' account as he described it in the January 1989 MUFON Journal. And for all you UAP GURB community members who watched my Sean Kirkpatrick and Arrow video, Jacobs testified under oath to Arrow and Sean Kirkpatrick on February 10th, 2023. So how about that for no credible witnesses? And now for the case, David Grush directly confirmed this fact with his interview with Ross Coulthart and News Nation, the Malmstrom Air Force Base incident. In 1967, United States Air Force First Lieutenant Robert Salas was the on-duty commander of an underground nuclear launch control facility assigned to Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana. Assigned to the 490th Minuteman Missile Squadron, Salas's primary duty was to monitor the readiness and security of 10 Minuteman missiles. During the night of March 24, 1967, Salas received a call from the Flight Security Controller, FSC I'll use from now on, that the flight team had been observing lights in the sky making unusual maneuvers. These lights were presumed not to be aircraft due to travel at high velocity with unusual directional change and no engine noise. Within minutes, Salas received another call from a screaming FSC agent, telling Salas a pulsating red oval-shaped object was hovering over the front gate measuring 30 to 40 feet in diameter. The men at arms were outside with weapons drawn at the object. The craft appeared to be difficult to determine a structure due to the blinding glow of light. At this time, alarms and indicators at the commander console began to go haywire. The men scrambled to go through checklists and procedures, the indicators for all 10 
Minuteman nuclear missiles showed a red colored fault status, meaning the missiles were disabled and unable to launch. Most, if not all of the missiles were experiencing guidance and control system failure. Soon after, the FSC reported the object had just randomly flown off. The remainder of the night, the missiles remained inoperable, but with no permanent damage. The following morning, Salas and his crew were relieved and debriefed by Squadron Commander Colonel George Eldridge. Eldridge assured Salas the incident was not part of any United States Air Force exercise and could not be explained why it had happened. An officer from the Air Force Office of Security and Intelligence told Malmstrom crew that the event was classified secret and they were not to speak of it. Salas swore this statement into record with a 2010 affidavit. In fact, three other men from Malmstrom swore the same incident into law with their own affidavits. These men being USAF First Lieutenant Robert C. Jameson, USAF Airman First Class Patrick McDonoghue, and Officer in Charge of Communications Dwin C. Arneson. If these two incidents weren't enough to make your skin crawl, let's dig just a little bit deeper. In 1977, a NORAD log released through the Freedom of Information Act showed 33 different UFO nuclear incidents over a two-week period in 1975. This was a direct contradiction to the Project Blue Book findings of 1969 given to Congress and the U.S. populace that UFOs were not a threat to national security. And wild enough, UFOs haven't just been interested in nuclear weapons, but also nuclear power too. So let's quickly cover the 1984 Indian nuclear power plant incident. On the 24th of July, 1984, the Indian Point nuclear power plant at Buchanan, New York, security police reported seeing a UFO with white, yellow, and blue oscillating lights, conically shaped and as long as three football fields. The plant experienced failure of movement sensors, alarms, and security control computers as it flew overhead. Over the next two days, U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission NRC, agents retained the plant's security operations and confiscated video and audio records of the event. Remember, the NRC was born alongside the DOE, the Department of Energy, from the Atomic Energy Commission, the AEC, in 1974. We know that the DOE has played an active hand in UAP research and probably crash retrieval and reverse engineering. Historically, the AEC was used to misclassify UFO records in 1954 under Transclassified Foreign Nuclear Material, but we never hear about the NRC. Around this same time, the NRC created an incident file for a black triangle UFO seen over Cooper Nuclear Station, Nebraska. So that leaves a question, how active is the NRC in the UFO cover-up? That's not our topic today, so maybe that's a video for another day. And these are not all the known cases of UFOs actively tampering with US nuclear weapons. In fact, there are quite a few more, but I'll save those for another video. Maybe I'll do a part two to this because today I wanted to cover two of my favorite cases, Malmstrom and Lieutenant Robert Jacobs. So. Nuclear weapons, nuclear energy, and UFOs are a reoccurring theme. Why do UFOs have interest in nuclear weapons? Well, th there's probably many reasons, but I like to boil it down to a possibility of the great filter. If you remember in my iceberg, I think it's level two, the Fermi paradox. If there's aliens out in the universe, why can't we see them? Terrible paradox, terrible statement. I hate that that's quoted all the time, but one of the solutions to that is the great filter. In every intelligent civilization's lifetime, they pass a series of gates in which the civilization will either survive and thrive or destroy itself. One of those gates, in my opinion, is the harnessing of atomic fission and fusion. Of course, we're still far away from atomic fusion. Um, in fact, if you guys remember, I think it was last year or the year before, there were a bunch of clickbaity news articles saying China has harnessed the power of the sun. That was just the longest sustained fusion reaction, which was, I think, in the period of nanoseconds. So fission is what you think of when you think of atomic weaponry and nuclear weaponry, and that is the separation of energy, of atoms. 
and nuclear fusion is the fusing together of hydrogen atoms and that's what our sun does but the harnessing of this technology and power of the atomic world is this one of the great filters of course with nuclear weapons we as humans have the power to destroy ourselves if we harness atomic fusion we have the power to maintain energy systems that have a greater energy output than energy put in which is impossible for us at the current moment so the harnessing of this technologies would truly make or break our civilization does this attract other species throughout the universe let's remember when did the roswell crash occur 1947 when did our first atomic tests occur i think early 40 i think 42 through 44 is when our first atomic tests and of course the bombings of hiroshima and nagasaki 45 so pretty soon after that we have our first high profile crash retrieval of course ufos have been here before then but there seems to be a heavy pickup of interest when humans have started to harness the power of the atom so that's just my guess that atomic fusion and fission is just one step of the great filter and that some sort of species out in this universe are interested to see what we do with it anyway guys i am uap gerb thank you so much for joining me today i'm so proud of how this community has grown so if you could please like and subscribe and leave a comment i want to know your thoughts on this but anyway guys Stay spooky, and I'll catch you later.